call and rescue. There are 80,999 calls made every day. Hello, what's the problem? It's the police. Uh, can I have a police? I uh, just stole my money. Who stole your money? Some are more serious than others. You have not breathing. Okay, blow the little boy flat on his back for me there. I know you flat on his back. On rare occasions, the call is to report a death. I've run over my wife who been feeding the cows and one of the cows must have known. Some people broke into her house. Okay, okay, okay. this was all his money. Okay, Tim. But what if the caller... <laughs> she's not moving. Right, she's not moving at all. ...is in fact a killer. Someone being stabbed, I think they're dead. good community. You watched out for each other, you asked everybody how they were. If you hear a bump, you'll go and knock. If you haven't seen somebody, you'll go and find out if they're okay. Acom has about as much crime as any other similar community. There's maybe petty things like a bit of burglary, maybe a bike's been pinched. Murders are very rare. You just don't come across them that often. But on the 4th of March 2011, an incident occurred that tore this close-knit community apart. Is he still there? No, he's gone now. I'm just worried he might do some stupid nerdy stuff. He was saying all sorts of crazy things. In no circumstances would you have ever imagined that to have happened, especially when it's just over the road, somebody that you know. It's the last thing you think of. first time that I met Mark Webb would have been at one of his children's birthday parties. My daughter had been invited and they only lived around the corner. He was a big bloke with a very, very big, booming voice, but he was quite quiet. Mark was described as a fun-loving family man. He was loved. He loved a drink. Nine times out of ten, whenever you spoke to Mark, he'd had a drink. Or oh, two, three, however many. He would be <laughs> swaying down the street, because he'd obviously had a, one too many. The dad, I would say, was pretty good. Even though he was a drinker, when you watched him with his kids, he was just brilliant. But he could come across as quite scary, because he's such a big bloke. Mark Webb had been married to his wife Susan for 13 years. Susie, complete opposite to Mark. Very opinionated. She wasn't shy to say what she wanted to say. But yeah, she was well known and well liked by a lot of the parents at school. But after 13 years together, Mark and Susan's marriage was under strain. I'm fed up of this, Mark. Would you stop? Every time you come back, you're drunk. Not drunk. Yes, you are. Don't you give me this. As Mark's drinking escalated out of control. Give me that. Give me that. Oh, that's really clever. Right. The couple drifted apart. Now what are you going to do? You don't it? think about it anymore. Go on, get out. By November 2010, the relationship hit rock bottom, and the couple decided to separate. wanted it over and done with. She didn't want to have anything more to do with Mark. She was upset at Mark's behavior towards her. And she had a non-molestation order out against him on the grounds that he had been violent to her when he was in drink. Mark Webb moved out of the marital home into temporary accommodation a few streets away. Mark didn't want the relationship to end. He wanted to keep in contact with Susan and their children. I, uh, can, can I come in? Mark, come on, Please just, just take go. me back. 
Susan, I, I just want to come in. Just let me talk to you. You've had too many chances. Just go on. Susan. It's done. Susan, don't do it's this. Over. Susan, please, come on. The separation from his wife hit Mark Webb hard. He was drinking more heavily and was now suffering from depression. And on New Year's 2010, he self-harmed in a possible suicide attempt. After Mark's recovery, the couple continued to have an amicable relationship for the sake of their children. Around the time of her breakup, Susan Webb became close friends with another local woman, Carrie Munton. Hello, you all right? Come on in. Carrie Munton lived a short distance away from where Susan lived. They could literally see each other's houses from their own houses. They knew each other through the community. They were good friends. They seemed to spend quite a lot of time together. Susie seemed to spend a lot of time at Kerry's house, more than her own from what I can remember. It was an unlikely friendship to me. I wondered why them two had connected. They were so different. Kerry seemed to be very laid back, couldn't give a monkey's uncle about what was going on. Whereas Susie was more opinionated. So it just seemed a really unlikely friendship. <laughs> When Kerry moved in, I thought she'd moved in by herself. But then it turns out she had a partner. Kerry Munton's partner was 34-year-old Paul Quinn. And he was a bit of a odd bod as well. I can't put my finger on it, but there was just something about him. He was very quiet. So yeah, he was living there. And then all of a sudden, this other bloke started to appear. And it was notable because he's a very tall bloke. The new addition to the street was 29-year-old Brian Cox. He stuck out like a sore thumb. And I remember him being in biker leather all the time and was often in and out of Kerry's house or tinkering with some machinery out in the street. I think what made him stand out for me was not only was he tall, but his hair. His hair was down to his shoulders and kind of had that windswept look. He's definitely stood out in the Stuart Road. He was definitely a stranger in the mix. It wasn't long after Brian had moved into Carrie Munton's house Thank you. that he met Susan Webb. I think for Susan, Brian Cox was protection. He was the chance of a new future. I think that was the attraction of Brian Cox for Susan. There was a whole series of text messages and phone calls between Mark and Susan starting probably about eight o'clock that morning. They started calling, but gradually the tone changes. Susan was trying to distance herself from him. She's using this to goad Mark and Mark is getting angry. She didn't want him to see the children. She told him that she was seeing someone else. She was, she was trying to make life unpleasant for him confident that she had someone to protect her and confident that they weren't living together now. Mark then phoned Susan's mother. Yes, Mark. Is it true about Susie? 
that she's got a new fella. And then a bit later on, he texts Susan to say, Bitch. So why do you cheat on me? I never did for you. I think Susan was wanting to make life as unpleasant for Mark as she could. And she was enjoying making it unpleasant for him. Mark spent quite a bit of time on March the 4th drinking. He was in drink by the time he came round to Kerry Mankton's. Susie! Susie, let me in. He was angry, he was aggressive. Susan, let me in. I'm going to bust this door down if you don't let me in. Susan! I'm being serious, girl. I'm not going anywhere, love. You better let me in now. Who's that shouting? Sorry, Kerry, it's Mark. He's back from the pub. Really let me in. Come on! I'm being serious, girl. Come on, let me in. There's all my kids too. Come on. Susan, let me in. Susan! At 5.40 p.m., Susan Webb telephoned the emergency services. Hello, what's the emergency? Police, please. What's the address? I'm at my friend Kerry Watson's house. My ex-husband just come round. He's really drunk. He's been banging on the door. On the 4th of March 2011, after a series of text messages, a concerned Susan Webb called the emergency services about her husband. Later that afternoon, a single police officer visited Stuart Road in response to Susan Webb's concerned call about her husband's state of mind. PC Fennell was the first policeman on the scene. He saw a trail of blood, and he followed it. At the end of it, he found Mark Webb in the garden of the Webb marital home. Yeah, we've got a man over here. He's uh, severely wounded. Policeman, of course, did his best for him. He tried to give him resuscitation. He tried to stop the bleeding. Mark was barely alive and was taken by paramedics to York Hospital. But upon arrival, Mark Webb was pronounced dead. told her that Mark was dead, Susan was hysterical. But Susan Webb's 999 call wasn't the only call police received about Mark Webb. There were two 999 calls that evening. One was from Susan Webb and one was from Ms. Brown, who lived across the way. I had actually been off work sick with flu. I remember that day feeling a little bit better and I was going to attempt my first trip out of the house. I went out around half three to nip to the corner shop. The street was so quiet. There was no kids playing, no cars no parents chatting at gates like there usually is, and it's like the calm before the storm. There was nobody in the street except for Susie. No, Mark, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want you seeing the kids. And she was over the road, and she was on the phone to Mark. No, 
Ma, look, it's, it's just not going to work. And she seemed to be quite calm. But then when I came back and she was still on the phone, Brian was there and he was very calm. She seemed to be getting quite agitated. Yeah, yeah, it'll be here. There's no point in me even trying to say I wasn't eavesdropping because I didn't get the choice. It was loud enough that anybody in the street could have heard what was being said. That's it. You're not seeing the kids. You're useless, Mark. You've always been useless. She was just me. telling me how useless he was, that she did everything. Nothing to look after our family. She was just having a right go. So I went into the house and me being me, shouted upstairs to the girls, is she still at it? My girls, they'd sit watching passers-by and they were like, yeah, I said, do me a favour and just keep an eye. And then I heard Mark's coming down the street. Susie! Susie, let me in. You're going to let me in. You're going to bloody let me in. Come on! Getting another running commentary from the girls saying different bits. Susie! And they said, oh, there's another bloke there as well. Then I heard he's come out. And then they said to me, Mark's gone across the road, heading towards Middleton Road to the house. He was swaying as if he was drunk. And because he was known as a drinker, you just presume he's had a drink, he's swaying. And the other guy, they said, had run down the street. I was panicking and I picked up the phone and I said, I, I need to ring the police. I reported that there'd been an incident at this house and they said, don't worry, somebody else has already rung, it's under control. And I said, you sure it's all under control? Yes, it's, we've got it under control. Right, fine, put the phone down. And then I hear police cars coming down the road. I'm looking out the window going, oh my Lord, look at all those police cars. There was loads of them. It was just like ants coming out of woodwork. There was police everywhere. It was then that I saw Kerry. And because I know Kerry, I shouted, what's happened? And that's when she said, he's done it to himself. And she used her hands to gesture to her throat. It was just disbelief, because it was like, how, why would he have done that? How would he have done that? I don't, it, it didn't sink in. You don't quite believe what you're hearing. He's not the type of bloke to have done that to himself. Because he loves his kids, why would he leave his kids behind? I just can't see him doing it. Kerry seemed to be stopping and talking to everybody that she met as she walked up the road. She just kept saying, he's done it to himself, he's done it to himself. There was no sign of Susie, there was no sign of anybody else, just Kerry. Not long after Mark was pronounced dead, rumours started appearing on social media. It was Kerry who first put the rumours about Mark committing suicide on Facebook. With all the police and ambulances and things in our street, people were curious as to what had happened. So there'd been things put on asking what was going on and other people had put answers to what they thought was going on and there was speculation. And so Susie in reply had put something on in regards to stop talking about all this, stop speculating, and, and please think about the children in this hard time. There's a policewoman man in the gate at Kerry's house, and I can't remember what we were talking about, but I just happened to mention that the man that had run off. And she looked at me and said, what man that run off? I said, my girls told me there was a man that ran off when Mark was leaving the house. So this is my old house. So up there was where my two girls watched what occurred on the night that Mark was killed. And we saw Mark come down this street from that side all the way down to Kerry's house and then they were able to see from Kerry's house, Mark walking across the road. Where that red car's going is where Susie lived, and that's where Mark walked to. This house here is, or should I say was, Kerry Munton's house, and this is the gate that I actually spoke to the policewoman at. 
Mark appeared in the alleyway, cut across the grass, and started to walk up here. Now my girls, you can see my my girls' bedroom window from here, so you can you can see that they can actually see Mark come out and come across. He's walked from where that blue gate is, and he's walked across. The girls said they saw him with his hand across his neck, um, and it wasn't until later that they told me he'd got blood on his hands. Um, they just said he'd walked out holding his neck, but was staggering this way, um, and it took a while for them to find him. So this is where Mark ended up. He ended up in this garden, as far as we know, by the shed. After Liz Brown told the police officer what her daughters had seen, the police quickly took her back to her house and two plain-clothed police officers arrived to interview her daughters. It wasn't until the policeman came that we realised this was a big deal. Now our houses are very, very thin walls. You can hear a pin drop usually. The older policeman took a phone call. He went and stood at the bottom of our stairs and shut the door because he obviously thought he was going to get peace and quiet. But we overheard him on the phone actually say it's a murder investigation. We were aware then that Mark had died and it was a murder. On the 4th of March 2011, after numerous text messages and phone calls with his estranged wife, Mark Webb's body was found in the garden of his ex-wife's house. Yeah, we've got a man over here, he's severely wounded. Rumours on the street were that Mark Webb had killed himself. But eyewitness accounts revealed a second man fleeing the scene. We were aware then that Mark had died and it was a murder. With a murder investigation now underway, the police made the decision to bring in Susan and her associates for questioning. The police generally don't say why they arrest people, unless you're really pushing them. They say they had arrested essentially every adult in the house in connection with the murder. Early on the Saturday morning, the newspaper got a tip off from somebody in the area. So as a duty reporter, I went out to find out what was happening or what had happened. It was obvious something major had happened. There was a policeman standing guard over his house, which was uh, taped off. And where I could see something that looked like a trail of blood. So at that point, I knew that this was definitely very serious. The blood was on the pavement. It was in splodges. They looked as if they dried there. It stretched for some considerable distance. I could see it stretching away into the cordoned off area. Looking at the blood trail, looking at the police cordons, looking at the policemen standing guard, I was thinking, there's been some kind of fight, and somebody has been very seriously injured. This could be fatal. The post-mortem was undertaken at the mortuary in York. The immediate thing that was readily apparent was that there were four large incised wounds to the neck. So he had had in common terms, his throat cut. It was fairly clear, fairly quickly, that they had cut major blood vessels, and they were lethal injuries. After I'd had a look at the scene, I wanted to speak to people to find out what had been happening. So I started knocking on doors. A lot of the neighbors didn't answer. It was Saturday morning, they were out shopping, they were out with the children, and those that did answer, didn't want to talk. It's a close-knit community. Everybody knows everyone. They didn't want to say something that might annoy somebody they knew. Meanwhile, at the local police station, Susan Webb maintained the same account she'd given on the 999 call. He came round to house. He was drunk out of his mind. 
He was swearing and threatening he'd do something to himself. Susan Webb's account indicated Mark's death must have been suicide. It is physically possible for someone to inflict these injuries upon themselves, but people who cut their own throats tend to use their dominant hand, I'm left-handed, and to go across. And so you will go deep to shallow in that direction. Typically, somebody who does that will also just nick at the skin. They're called tentative marks before they actually finally do something significant. I took the view very early on that these injuries seemed to be by far and away more with somebody having done this than a self-inflicted type injury. Post-mortem results and a sighting of a second man in the alleyway had now ruled out Susan Webb's account of death by suicide. On Sunday, two days after the murder, the police put out a statement that a man had died. They didn't give any more details than that. A man had been stabbed. They were treating it as murder, and they were looking for witnesses. Alongside Susan Webb, also in custody were Carrie Munton and her partner, Paul Quinn. But a new arrest was about to change the course of the investigation. Brian Cox handed himself in to local police. All right, why don't you tell me what happened? I went outside to try and calm him down. You can't come in, Susie. You can't come. He tried to get past me. I tried to stop him. <laughs> he stepped back, and I saw the blood. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you, mate. It's not sweet. It's not sweet. He ran off. I just panicked. I ran away. Brian Cox said he had been holding the knife as he was trimming a carpet at Carey's house. But detectives did not believe Brian Cox's account of a struggle that ended in Mark's accidental death. Brian Cox was charged with the murder of Mark Webb. Whilst Kerry Munton and her partner Paul Quinn were released without charge. Susan Webb was charged with two accounts of perverting the course of justice in connection to her husband's murder. The Webb family were in the public gallery sitting behind the press. Against the back wall, you had the dock with Brian Cox and Susan Webb standing alongside each other, but not looking at each other. From the way they behaved in court, you wouldn't think that they knew each other. There was no sign of a loving relationship there. Over the course of the investigation, detectives had discovered Susan Webb was not Brian Cox's only lover. After the altercation in the alleyway, Brian Cox had sought help from Don Coates, the other woman in his life. Just like Susan, Brian had an ex-partner, and that ex-partner was Dawn Coates. Dawn had a non-molestation order out against Brian, but the two of them were trying to get the relationship back together again, and he'd bought her an engagement ring. It's beautiful. So there you have a love triangle centered around Brian with Susan, the new woman who was desperately trying to make the relationship between her and Brian work, and Brian who was doing his best to revive an old relationship. Susan didn't know that. After an afternoon spent drinking and exchanging text messages with his estranged wife, Mark Webb's body was discovered in the garden of his ex-wife's home. After handing himself to the police, Brian Cox was charged with Mark's murder. 
As Brian Cox gave evidence at trial, he maintained his account that Mark Webb had been accidentally cut during their altercation. I, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Brian's version was that he went out into the courtyard to essentially calm down the situation. Sorry, mate, you, you can't come in. Susie doesn't want to see you. You can't bloody tell me what to do. Get out. Get out. And that he didn't realise he had a standing knife with him when he went out there and that he'd used his doorman's techniques to restrain Mark, and by that had accidentally cut him. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you, mate. He claimed that when he saw the cut, he told Mark that he would help him, and Mark refused the help. And he then says he left. I, I just ran. It was the stupidest decision I've ever made. He's doing his very best to paint it as a complete accident. But it was clear from the pathologist report that this was not an accident. Pathology was of deep, severe incised wounds. That's not two people fighting. That is one person causing injury. <laughs> Once these injuries are sustained, you are going to start to bleed heavily. The two carotid arteries carry about a quarter of your body's blood supply to your brain. So you are talking about torrential bleeding. As Mark Webb staggered the 61 meters to his former marital home, Brian Cox fled the scene, running to his friend Mark Johnson's house. Mark Johnson told the court that Brian had appeared looking flustered and panicked. He made a point of not touching anything or shaking his friend's hand. He came at me with a knife, I turned it on him. He tells a friend, I've done something stupid. I've I slit someone's throat. throat. Brian Cox just doesn't seem to know what to do. Well, I need to take my jacket. No, no way. The court asked Mark Johnson if he gave any advice to Brian Cox, to which he replied, do the right thing and turn yourself in. After the friend tells him, you've got to hand yourself in, Brian decides no and goes to the house of his ex-partner, Dawn Coates. So he goes round to Dawn's house. He gives her his jacket to clean, doesn't tell her why. She gives him another jacket. I'll be back later. Dawn told police that she had washed the jacket that Brian had been wearing as she had done numerous times before. She told officers that she used a stain remover as it had oil on it, but denied seeing any blood on the item of clothing. Susan was calm throughout the trial. Mark came round. He was swearing, ranting, screaming he was going to do something to himself. Susan tried to portray herself as loving Mark, but she didn't show the emotion you would expect. Reaction from the gallery was strongest when Susan was given evidence. There were strong gasps from the Webb family at what she was saying. They did not recognize the mark that she was painting in the witness box. She was saying that effectively he was to blame, it was suicide, and she loved him. The Webb family didn't believe that. Susan kept the lies going. She kept them right up from the evening of the incident into the trial. She never changed. She continued to maintain that Mark was the person to blame, not Brian. The prosecution's key witness came from an unexpected source. Susan Webb's best friend, Kerry Munton. One of the most dramatic moments in the trial was when Kerry gave evidence for the prosecution. She turned Queen's evidence. She gave evidence for the prosecution against both Susan and Brian. I was worried. She scared me. I felt threatened. 
In her police interview, Carrie Munton revealed to detectives that Susan Webb had pressurized her into spreading false rumors about Mark's apparent suicide. You should call the police. And tell them what? About Brian. No. And Mark. No, I'm not telling them about Brian. This is his fault. This has been coming to Mark. Brian ain't going down for this. Susie, he was bleeding. I'm serious. I'll tell him how he was acting all crazy, like he was threatening to do something to himself. This has been coming to him for a long time. It isn't Brian's fault. What about the blood? I'll clear it up. I'll call the police and tell him how he come round. We need to start spreading the word that Mark did this to himself. You need to get out there and start telling people. Me? Yeah, you. You're involved now. Oh, honey. I need bleach and a scrubbing brush. On the afternoon of the murder, as Brian Cox ran to Don Colt's house, Susan Webb began a conspiracy to cover up the murder. Susan claimed that she cleaned away the blood because she was concerned it might be seen by children. There was blood on the wall, there was blood on the floor, there was a trail of blood leading away. She must have known, must have known, that he was very, very badly injured. call is played in court there's always that heightened sense of this is how it actually happened she told the police that mark was drunk no but he's been drinking and he was um, shouting and swearing at me she said that one of her friends had gone out to speak to him he had then left the area outside the house where she was and had gone elsewhere so the police were misdirected away from where it had happened by Susan. And Susan made absolutely no indication that Mark was injured in that 999 call. Putting that 999 call into context, you thought, she sounds realistic in that. She sounds genuine. And yet, you knew she wasn't. She put on a good performance. Immediately after the 999 call, Brian Cox called Susan Webb. Brian, no. Brian, calm down. You're not handing yourself in. She told him she would we'll cover, cover for him we'll and not to hand yet. himself in. Her cover-up plan was now in motion. Don't worry. I'm going to tell everyone how he did it to himself. It was, it was suicide, a cry for help. When Brian ran off, Susan had a decision to make. By staying with Mark, she would have got him help. But for her, Mark was the past. She decided to stay with Brian. So that led her into clearing away the blood, spreading the false tales about Mark trying to kill himself, blackening his name as much as she could to make him the person to blame for the whole situation. But Susan was breaking the law. Susan was doing her best to hinder the police investigation and to protect the murderer. It led her to persuade Kerry initially to go along with the story. You're involved now. And it led her to tell Brian, don't give yourself up. She made that decision in the immediate aftermath of Mark being fatally injured, that she was going to protect Brian at all costs. As the trial came to a close, one last piece of information was shared with the court. A pathologist said that the cuts were not of themselves necessarily fatal. 
If he had received immediate help, he could have survived. Uh, severely wounded. But of course, he didn't. And therefore, the injuries killed him. After three days of deliberation, the jury returned their verdict. Brian got a life sentence. He will have to serve a minimum of 18 years, starting from when he was first remanded in custody. Mark's family were relieved by the verdicts. It was what they wanted. It was a sense of, yes, justice has been done. Susan received two years imprisonment for perverting the course of justice twice, and she cried when she was jailed. The Webb family certainly didn't think that two years was a long enough sentence for Susan. Susan had been the one who denied Mark his chance to survive because she was the one who could have immediately got him help when she phoned the police in that long 999 call and never once mentioned that he was injured or that he needed an ambulance. That was the delay that deprived him of any chance of survival. I think this case shows what can happen and how easily matters can get completely out of control when you have strong emotions and people who are prepared to push things to the absolute limit. It rocked the neighbourhood, absolutely rocked it. So when things like that happen, you don't feel safe. And until that point, you, you were all right. It's definitely unnerving. The, that you feel like that presence is here, that, that atmosphere is still about. It doesn't matter what the family's going to say to the children, they'll read the papers, they'll hear gossip, they'll hear rumours, and they'll know. And that's got to be the hardest thing, is knowing that them four kids are going to grow up, knowing that their mum was involved and the dad's dead for it. Awful.